let me just hand it over to a moderator who is Judge Lawrence Van Dyke of the Ninth Circuit, and perhaps the, uh, I was going to say the greatest thing to recommend him, but the dearest thing is, before he ascended to the bench, he was a member of the Executive Committee of the Religious Liberty Practice Group. So, Judge Van Dyke. Thank you, Bill, um, and welcome to this year's panel sponsored by the Religious uh, Liberties Practice Group, which is titled Religious Liberty After Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. And it's my honor to moderate what I think we've assembled as an amazing panel to discuss one of the Supreme Court's um, most recent religious liberty cases, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. And you'll notice I, I say recent instead of blockbuster or landmark uh, because I don't want I don't want to taint the taint the well here. Uh, and I hope our distinguished panelists will discuss this issue this afternoon, but there's some dispute about whether and what exactly this case did, uh, the Fulton case. Um, it was widely anticipated, I think, to do a lot, and, um, and we're not sure exactly what it did. So that's, what, that's one of the things that we're, I'm hoping to um, hear about from our panelists today. And while, uh, but while Fulton will be the center of gravity of, of their comments, I think, um, I'm hopefully that our panel will address some broader topics, including what the future of Employment Division versus Smith is. Um, is there a better theory uh, for the free exercise clause? And why, why does the Supreme Court seem so enamored with deciding religious liberty cases so narrowly? Perhaps maybe it's something we can talk about. Uh, let me give a brief introduction of each of our panelists uh, in the order that they're going to speak. And then I'm just going to let them go um, without an introduction in between. Each of the panelists is going to give us about eight minutes of opening remarks plus or minus, and then I'm going to, once they've all finished, obviously I'm going to let them respond to any of the other panelists' remarks if they'd like. And uh, I might exercise the moderator's privilege to ask a question or two, but then I really want to open it up and let all of you ask questions to our panelists. Uh, I'm only going to give a brief bi biography of each of the panelists because I think you have the materials somewhere. I don't actually know where, but they're available somewhere online. Um, and if you want to, uh, and you want to hear from them, not me. We're going to start with uh, Lori Wyndham. She's senior counsel at Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. And um, I've actually known Lori since we went to law school together. And uh, I think she may have started at Beckett right after law school, Lori. I can't, um, and she's been there defending religious liberty both in the courtroom and also by testifying in front of governmental bodies and other entities um, ever since. But most recently, and perhaps most relevant to our discussion today, she was the one who argued the Fulton case on behalf of the petitioners at the Supreme Court winning that victory for her clients. So I'm going to start with Lori, and then she's going to be followed by Akhil Amar, who's a Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches both in the college and at law school. He's authored over 100 articles and multiple books and is widely acknowledged for his originalism research. He's been cited by the Supreme Court in over 40 cases. And uh, perhaps uh, Professor Sunstein said it best uh, in a review of one of Akil's books where he said, uh, Justice Scalia is the most famous originalist, but in the law schools, the most influential originalist may be Akil Reed Amar. So we're very delighted to have him talk about this topic today. And then after Akil, we'll hear from um, Tom Berg, Professor Tom Berg, who's the James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy at the University of Thomas School of Law. At St. Thomas, uh, Professor uh, Berg teaches, religious, teaches on religious liberty, con law, and runs their religious liberty clinic. And he and Professor McConnell have one of the leading textbooks on religion and law. And Professor Berg has authored around 70 briefs in the Supreme Court and in other courts on religious freedom issues. And last but not least, we'll end with Professor Bill Marshall, the William, William Rand Keenan Jr. Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law where he teaches, among other things, on the free exercise clause. And Bill, um, I, I was, when I was reading Bill's bio, I was happy to see that he looks like he spent time in multiple states' attorneys general's office, which has a soft spot in my heart because I spent uh, time in multiple states' attorneys general office. He was, uh, he was a deputy counsel and deputy assistant to the president during the Clinton administration and also served, I think, as a solicitor general of Ohio uh, and the special assistant attorney general for the state of Minnesota. So. I won't ask him how he got between those two states because they don't ask me how I moved around so much. But uh, having, having worked in those, that's a soft spot in my heart. So, Lori, why don't you start us off? Thank you, Judge Van Dyke, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I want to start off, of course, talking about Fulton. And I want to talk about Sharon L. Fulton, who's a single black foster mom 
over more than 20 years of service, she's cared for more than 40 children in her home, giving them a home, loving them, caring for them. What she says, and she said it again and again, is there's room in my heart, there's room in my home. I want to care for these kids. In March of 2018, the city of Philadelphia decided it would no longer allow any foster children to be placed in Sharonelle's home because Sharonelle works with Catholic Social Services of Philadelphia, an agency that shares and affirms her faith and has supported her on her foster care journey. The city of Philadelphia learned that Catholic Social Services did not provide written home study endorsements for unmarried or same-sex couples, even though no same-sex couple had ever approached them asking for that kind of endorsement, they decided that they would no longer place any children with the agency or with any parents who worked with the agency. Uh, I'm gonna fast forward now to the end and skip over the part you all actually wanna hear about to tell you what's happening now, which is that today, Catholic Social Services and its families are placing children once again. They're welcoming children into homes, uniting them with loving parents and helping them through this very difficult phase of life. They're doing that because we have a consent decree uh, with the city of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia is permanently enjoined to continue working with Catholic Social Services, not excluding them or excluding families like Sharon L's because of their religious beliefs and practices. Um, as Judge Van Dyke alluded to, that might come as a surprise to some of you in the room because you're thinking, but wait, I'm not sure how consequential this decision was. I'm not sure why it would end up this way. I actually have a theory about why it ended up this way. Uh, only the city's lawyers know for sure why this is, the, this is where we ended up. But I think the reason it ended up this way is that we don't have the same free exercise clause that we had in 1990. If you remember one thing that I say today, with this a very distinguished panel, I don't know if you remember anything I say today, but if you remember one thing I say today, remember this. It's not the 1990s anymore, and not every 90s trend comes back. <laughs> what we have is a free exercise clause that has developed and evolved. And as it stands today, Employment Division versus Smith actually only governs a minority of cases. And I would say a rapidly shrinking minority of cases. Now, I want to speak for a few minutes as a litigator, talking about when these cases come before you, how do you think about it? I know we're going to have a lot of discussion on the history and the theory today, and I'm really excited to hear it. But I want to set the table a little bit to talk about how we got here. Um, after Smith, Congress came together with overwhelming bipartisan majorities. This is a thing that happened in our lifetimes. They came together and they passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and it was signed by President Clinton, also known as RIFRA, a four-letter word now in many jurisdictions. But Congress said, we don't want the Smith standard. We want a standard that is more protective of religious exercise. If the government burdens religious exercise, it needs to pass strict scrutiny. RIFRA applies to all federal law in the implementation of that law, and that's how it applies today. Congress later passed RLUIPA, applying that same standard to even state and local actions in the land use context and in prisons. And you have about half the states that have also said, either by legislation, by constitutional amendment, or by state Supreme Court decisions, that, you know, we think we can do better than Smith too. We want to provide our citizens with more protection than is currently available under the Free Exercise Clause. And so we want a standard that looks like RIFRA. And that is the standard they have. And so when you're looking at a free exercise case, RIFRA, RLUIPA, or state law, rather than Smith, is going to apply in many, many cases. Ask the Little Sisters of the Poor. And so the Supreme Court then continued to develop the doctrine independent of what was going on in the legislative arena. Uh, they, of course, passed, uh, they handed down the Lukumi decision, where they started to explain this whole neutrality and general applicability thing that was in the Smith decision. Lukumi's really helpful, um, but the circumstances there are pretty extreme. And so in the lower courts, um, my experience has been that lower courts often distinguish cases from Lukumi, because they're like, yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. What happened here wasn't nearly as bad. Uh, and so we don't think Lukumi applies. Um, but what has happened, especially in the last few years, is that the Supreme Court has really put some teeth into the neutrality and general applicability standards. They did that in Trinity Lutheran, where they applied it even in the context of government funding. 
and said, look, if you're going to exclude religious organization because it is a religious organization, even absent any kind of proof of, of animus, that is not a neutral law. And so that is something that is not governed by Smith. It's going to be governed, arguably, by strict scrutiny. I know there's some debate about that. Um, they did the same thing in Espinoza, where they said even in the school funding context, you're not going to be able to exclude religious schools. They also looked at the negative uh, and dark history of the Blaine Amendments and said, this is not a neutral policy. You're not going to be able to treat religion in this way. It's going to go to strict scrutiny. They took on the masterpiece case, and they said if the decision makers, the government officials who are in charge, do not remember their own high duty to the Constitution when they're making these decisions, that's not neutral either, and that's not governed by Smith. Then we had a fascinating series of decisions that came up in the context of COVID, where you had states across the country that had shutdowns, they restricted religious gatherings, and they restricted other gatherings as well. So these questions come to the Supreme Court, and the court is asked again and again, how far is too far? Are these laws neutral and generally applicable? Because there's a lot of people who are restricted from gathering in a lot of different ways. And yet the court, in a series of decisions, starting with Diocese of Brooklyn and ending with the Tandon decision, said, no, if you're going to say that you can have 20 people together in a factory, but not 20 people together in a synagogue. That's not a generally applicable law. Even if you are restricting other kinds of gatherings as well, where you're going to uh, treat certain secular activities that pose, that pose similar risks better than gathering for religious worship, that's not a generally applicable law. That's not covered by Smith. We're going to go to strict scrutiny. And then we come to Fulton, where the court looked at individualized exemptions. What we had in Fulton was a contract provision that said that there are certain rules that apply, but the commissioner in her sole discretion could choose to waive those rules in certain circumstances. And the Supreme Court said, look, when you have a government decision maker who can unilaterally decide in a discretionary way where the rules apply and where they don't, this is not the kind of neutral, generally applicable law that Smith envisioned. This is, as the Chief Justice said, this is a case that falls outside Smith. It's an individualized assessment. Uh, this was interesting because Smith had distinguished Sherbert in the prior line of cases on the basis that those were individualized assessments. This was something that had previously been used in the unemployment context. And the court applied it in Fulton and showed that the individualized assessments piece of it actually does have some teeth. Um, this is a line of cases following Smith and Lukumi, but there are other lines as well. There's the Hosanna Tabor decision, the Our Lady of Guadalupe decision, where the Supreme Court said that there's a line of cases where we're not even gonna look at Smith at all. Justice Scalia was quite clear in the, in the oral argument at Hosanna Tabor that this wasn't a Smith case. This is a case about a church's ability, a religious body's ability to select its leaders, to engage in its own internal decision-making and to run its own affairs. These are cases that are not governed by Smith. And so I know my time is running short. This is the problem with litigators. So I will say very briefly, what we have now is a free exercise clause that starts to look a lot more like a free speech clause. This is great news for law professors. Those exam questions are gonna be so much easier to write because it's not one standard that you apply anymore. Like a free speech case, you say, what kind of case do I have? What kind of circumstance, what kind of restriction on religious exercise? Is this a ministerial exception case, a church autonomy case? Is this a case of individualized exemptions? Is this a case of non-neutrality? Is this a case of different kinds of rules for different sets of people? And that's where the starting point is. Uh, Smith is still wrong. It still ought to be overruled, and I'm sure we'll have a long discussion about that today. But this, what I want to leave you with is the idea that Smith no longer controls most cases. I'm not happy to turn it over to Professor Amar. Uh, thank you. It's such an honor. Uh, such an honor to be with my dear friends in the Federalist Society. Um, so let's move from the recent case to um, originalist first principles. We'll start with the First Amendment. We'll start with its first word, Congress. 
The addressee of the First Amendment is Congress. It's about Congress making a law. And I've already told you enough to uh, explain that Smith, from a textualist and originalist point of view, before we get to the 14th Amendment, which may change things here, as it changes things in so many other areas, that Smith is rightly decided. You see, it's about the making of a law and telling Congress that it can't make law of a certain sort. That's the addressee. And at the time Congress is making a law, let's imagine it makes a law saying um, it's a federal crime to kill or maim uh, postal workers. It's necessary and proper. Um, at the um, but now there's some um, a religion that believes in killing postal workers. Now that religion, Congress might not know that that religion exists. Uh, the religion might not even exist at the time the law is made. Even if the religion does, the, the religious practice might not exist. Doctrines within religion change, just as um, within the court. Congress has made a perfectly valid law, you see, and it's the addressee of the First Amendment. Congress, make no law of a certain sort. So that's just almost the first word, the first three words. Now, let's think about it more um, in a more fulsome way. Um, intratextually, where's, it, where's that phrase coming from? Congress shall make no law. Well, it's coming, it's a riff on the, the necessary and proper clause. Congress shall have power to dot, 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 make all laws necessary and proper for certain purposes. And once again, you see that um, it's got to be about laws regulating religion as such, um, either formally or with the intent or the purpose of um, uh, harming or, or benefiting, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, this religion or, or that religion. Um, and that's not a proper purpose for Congress. Um, and so, once again, uh, it's, it's the original First Amendment is about laws targeting religion as such. Um, let's think about it more broadly. Why is the speech and press, um, uh, why are the speech and press clauses in the same amendment as the religion clauses? Because they're not in any state constitution at the time of uh, the 1780s and 90s. They're, those provisions in state constitutions for religion and speech are separate. But why are they put together in the First Amendment? Because this is also an amendment about federalism. These are domains of which Congress has no enumerated power. These are domains reserved to states. States can have established churches. Congress can't. But states can, in fact, Congress can't mess with established churches, can't try to disestablish a state's church. It's not just the First Amendment doesn't apply against the states. It's the state choice to have established churches, and half of them did, are protected from federal disestablishment because that would be a law on the topic of, in regards to, um, respecting is the key word of the First Amendment, and establishment of religion. So the First Amendment is a Tenth Amendment-like idea of local option. It's an American equivalent of the Peace of Augsburg of 1555 and the Peace of Westphalia of, of 1648, cuis regio, eis religio, there will be no imperial policy on religion, but it will be left to local option. The religion of the prince is the religion of the principality. It's a federalism idea of sorts. So once again, if that's so, it can't be about accommodation as such. It has to be basically about laws regulating religion as such, both because it's about Congress and about the making of a law, and, and um, this isn't a proper, ne necessary and proper purpose, and this is a domain beyond federal power. And finally, note the absolutism of the phrase, can make no law. There's no room for any override of any sort, any compelling state interest um, uh, 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 of any uh, size or shape. So textually, you see, and, and it could never be the case that just because the religious practice is sincere, it has to trump. You know, the, the Aztec religion demands um, the um, sacrifice of non-believing postal workers um, who aren't members of, who aren't co-religious, they have to be thrown into the volcano. Well, th uh, that can't be right. Um, there has to be some sort of override, and, but shall make no law doesn't admit of, of any of that. Now, um, so I've just shown you in about three minutes why my dear friend Michael McConnell has to be wrong in his article in the Harvard Law Review on the free exercise clause. And I love Michael, but no. Um, and, um, uh, and Justice um, uh, uh, Amy Coney Barrett says, hmm, 
Justice Alito, who, another one of my dear friends, who's channeling Michael McConnell, doesn't really seem to have very much history um, in support. That's true. This is a very big thing, you know, if there really were um, an exemption from ordinary neutral secular laws, and we'd expect there to be a lot of discussion about this and what's the nature and shape of the override and all the rest. This is a big elephant. And proverbially, elephants don't hide in mouse holes, and there's just not a lot of actually history. So she says that, she acknowledges that in Fulton, but she actually says, but textually, it actually seems that there is an argument for exemption. No, there isn't. I just gave you a bunch of clear textual arguments. Professor McConnell says, well, the framers believed in the logical priority of God when duties to the Almighty are prior to everything else, and so they have to actually override other things. That can't be right, because once you say that, there's no override, um, there, there's no compelling interest um, um, a Trump uh, to that. And, and, and again, that can't be right. We need some compelling interest, Trump, to that. Um, and that's ultimately going to be judged by a secular standard, not a religious standard. So we're no longer in the, no matter how strict the, the scrutiny is, it's still a secular standard. So we don't have the logical priority of God. So once again, with due respect, uh, Michael, no. Uh, now, does that mean that there's no strong argument for religious accommodation? No, it does not. Because I know it's going to surprise you, but Fulton is not a First Amendment case. And most of the f religious free exercise cases that pop into your head, most of the, quote, Bill of Rights cases that you would think about if I just played a free association game, think of 10 important Bill of Rights cases, almost none of them actually would be First Amendment cases. And strictly speaking, almost none of them would be Bill of Rights cases because the cases that you're thinking about involve state and local governments, which from a strict point of view are not First Amendment cases or Second Amendment cases apart from Heller or Fourth or Fifth or Sixth. They're Fourteenth Amendment cases. They're incorporation cases, as was Fulton. Of course, the Fourteenth Amendment um, is about not just states, but their, their arms and instrumentalities, cities and counties. And note how it's tracking the language of the First Amendment, but inverting it. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Shall make no law abridge. That's the language of the First Amendment, but it's inverting it, you see. Now it's about states and not just Congress. Oh, but it's also not just about the legislature or the state legislature or Congress making the law. It's make or enforce a law. And now we're focusing on the moment of enforcement when the religious practice does indeed exist and not the moment of making. So, hmm, maybe actually everything that I just said is inapplicable um, uh, given that we're talking about the 14th Amendment and not the First Amendment. Um, well, we still have to figure out, well, um, what, um, uh, and maybe it's actually a privilege of citizenship for there to be, in effect, um, substantive and not merely formal entitlements of a free exercise um, that actually have weight even against a general neutral secular law. It's possible to imagine that's um, a privilege. We're still going to need to figure out what what the boundary of that privilege is and what would count as a, a kind of override, a compelling interest. This was the thing that bothered Justice Scalia most of all in Smith, in footnote five of Smith. Um, and there are several possibilities, and here I'll end. So there are at least two ideas. And, and by the way, um, I'm summarizing to some extent the work of my brilliant um, Yale student, um, now professor, Kurt Lash, um, um, in an article in 1994 in the Northwestern Law Review, um, which I commend to you all. Um, he writes about the second adoption of the Free Exercise Clause, religious exemptions under the 14th Amendment, 88 Northwestern Law Review at page 11, excuse me, 1106, 1994. Okay, finally. So um, what's the override? Well, if it's a, a one idea is um, equality. Just if, if there are exceptions made for factories, why not for churches? And then the question is, um, how strictly are you going to apply that? If there's any exemption anywhere for a secular, does the religion benefit? Kind of strong, most favored nation status. Or on the other side, um, do you actually have to have um, lots and lots of other exemptions before we say, gee, churches should benefit as well? So how strictly you're going to enforce that equality, especially because churches may be different in certain respects. People aren't maybe breathing heavily and singing in factories next to each other the way they are um, um, in, in church. Um, so 
Um, but second, and she uh, and my colleague alluded to this with um, uh, the Hosanna Tabor case, we might I, think about another idea, which is an island of Lochner, um, um, a kind of libertarian idea, an idea of privilege as in privacy about the, the a religious organization uh, regulating itself, its own internal operations, uh, picking its leaders, um, uh, regulating its members with no external spillover on non-believers. So on this view, you know, jumping into the volcano um, enthusiastically if you're a co-religionist is maybe protected, but throwing non-believers into the volcano you see would be a, a very different thing indeed. Um, and with that, I think... Um, uh, I'm done. So thank you very much. And, and, and I'd like to turn and I would like to turn it over to my uh, dear friend Professor Berg, who happens actually to um, uh, be uh, a co-author of Professor McConnell's, for whom once again I have the highest regard in e in every way. <laughs> truly, truly. He doesn't say he had the highest regard for me, but. but <laughs> uh, I didn't trash you. <laughs> um, well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you um, very much for having me. And I just had my screen go away here, and let me get it back. Okay, so um, Fulton left open the question whether the court will revisit uh, the Smith case and subject burdens on religious exercise to vigorous scrutiny, even if the law in question is neutral and generally applicable. I, I think it does matter whether the court override, uh, overrules uh, Smith, and we can talk a little more in the discussion about why, uh, why it does, but let me just talk about what the court um, could do if it decides to overrule Smith. So Justice Alito argued at length in Fulton for overruling Smith, had two other votes joining him. Uh, Justice Barrett, joined by Justice Kavanaugh, um, agreed that as a matter of text and structure, it's difficult to see why the free exercise clause offers nothing more than protection from discrimination. So five justices indicated that Smith was mistaken, and there may be more than, than five. Um, but Justice Barrett was not ready to reconsider Smith when the case didn't require it, and she had questions about what would replace Smith. So I want to use my short time here, opening remarks, to address some of her questions. So first, Justice Barrett is right, I think, uh, that the textual and structural arguments against Smith are convincing. I'd say this with some trepidation, having just followed Akhil Amar, but the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. A law that prohibits religious exercise in a particular application still prohibits religious exercise even if it applies to other uh, behavior as well. Congress has made that law, and in a particular application, it, it uh, uh, bur may burden religious freedom. If you say that the mere application of a law can't violate the free exercise clause, then you are saying there also should be no as-applied challenges under the free speech clause, which likewise begins, Congress shall make no law. Uh, to the extent, for example, that there were a federal disturbing the peace uh, law, that doesn't any more than, uh, than, the, the, uh, than the, the kind of laws that might affect religion, that law doesn't uh, immediately anticipate that someone is going to speak and disturb the peace in the exercise of their speech. There are other ways to disturb the peace, right? So there wouldn't be a basis for challenging that law in application if we focused only at the moment of the adoption of the law by Congress or by the legislature. Uh, so uh, I think there's, there's a lot to be said uh, textually against Smith. What should replace Smith if the court does decide to over, overrule it? Justice Barrett was skeptical about uh, going back to a categorical strict scrutiny approach, particularly, she said, when the standard for conflicts between generally applicable laws and other First Amendment rights, like speech and assembly, has been much more nuanced. Uh, that's a quote from her concurrence. She doesn't say what those cases are, the more nuanced ones, but I think she's referring to two sets of cases which both apply pretty weak intermediate review. Uh, the first is United States versus O'Brien, upholding the conviction of a war pro protester for destroying a draft card. 
And the second set, I, uh, I assume, are the cases that uphold uh, content neutral time, place, and manner restrictions on speech. But in both of those situations, the court has emphasized, either in the case itself or in later explanations of it, that the speaker had alternative means of communication. A prohibition on symbolic conduct, like burning a draft card, leaves many other ways to express the same view. Uh, and the court allows time, place, and manner restrictions on speech if, but only if, they leave adequate alternative channels of communication. Prohibitions on religious practice are usually quite different. They leave no other way to follow the practice in question. If you face a substantial penalty for acting according to the tenets of your faith, it's no answer to say that you can follow other tenets of the faith. So in Holt versus Hobbes, the court unanimously rejected the uh, state of Arkansas's argument that barring a Muslim prisoner from wearing a beard did not substantially burden his exercise of Islam because he could still do many other Islamic practices, right? Wearing the beard was the religious exercise. Uh, religious practices are not fungible with each other. And assessing whether other things can be, in all, other practices can be an alternative to the one that's prohibited uh, involves courts in uh, uh, difficult religious judgments that are based on a, uh, a false premise. Each of these practices is itself the exercise of religion. So religious exercise is usually more like the multiple situa uh, situations in which the court has applied strict or at least rigorous scrutiny to generally applicable laws affecting speech or association. First, there are the cases about compelling organizations to disclose members or donors, dating back to the uh, NAACP ACP versus Alabama. Disclosure requirements mostly regulate conduct, not speech, and disclosure serves an uh, anti-corruption purpose unrelated to suppressing uh, expression. But the court is nevertheless required exemptions under rigorous scrutiny when the law significantly deters political association. Now, the, the um, Americans for Prosperity decision last term muddy, muddles or muddies the approach, uh, what the governing approach is, but six justices still take the position that serious burdens on association through compelled disclosure laws require compelling justification. Then there are the cases about expressive association and non-discrimination laws. Boy Scouts versus Dale applied strict scrutiny to invalid, validate application of a generally applicable non-discrimination law. The Hurley decision invalidated application of a general public accommodation law that forced parade organizers to admit a group inconsistent with their message. The JCs and Rotary cases held that strict scrutiny would apply if the compelled admission of women to those organizations would conflict with the organization's ideological positions. It just simply didn't conflict with their positions. So for all of these reasons, uh, in a recent article for the uh, Cato uh, Supreme Court Review, um, Professor Doug Laycock and I have argued that the compelling interest test, or at least some form of rigorous, rigorous scrutiny, should apply to substantial burdens on religious exercise uh, by analogy to these uh, other speech cases. Uh, uh, so the review, the, the, the better analogy from the speech uh, cases is to the ones that apply rigorous scrutiny rather than, than low-level scrutiny. The compelling interest test is rigorous, but in cases about religious conduct exemptions, it has not led to limited, li I'm sorry, limitless protection, the kind of anarchy that Justice Scalia feared in Smith. Government has greater interest in regulating conduct than in regulating speech. And generally applicable laws have more credibility and are easier to justify than laws that make significant exceptions for other interests while restricting religion. If the court thinks that strict scrutiny should really be reserved for those cases where the government action is virtually certain to be invalid, then it can adopt some form of rigorous review that's short of that virtual, abs uh, virtual absolute presumption. There are plenty of models from the vigorous intermediate scrutiny in sex discrimination cases to the uh, exacting scrutiny that the plurality adopted in American Prosperity uh, Foundation, uh, Americans for Prosperity, um, 
The danger is that intermediate scrutiny dissolve, devolves into that weak version that use, uh, was used in the draft card cases and others. And so if the court decides that strict scrutiny is uh, to be reserved for, these, for, for a, just a few categories, uh, it should expressly instruct that any kind of intermediate review in free exercise cases should still be rigorous. Um, under a general approach of rigorous scrutiny, more specific categorical rules can uh, develop over time, much as they've developed in speech cases. And those rules can rest both in history and in categorical balancing of interests. The ministerial exception that uh, Lori uh, Wyndham referred to, uh, which is absolute in, within its scope, uh, is grounded in the history of protecting le uh, decisions about religious leadership against government uh, interference, but it also reflects an assessment that suits by ministers against their religious employers severely burden religious exercise, and that society has a weakened interest in protecting ministers who, after all, have chosen to associate with that faith. So other categorical rules like this uh, can develop, and I'd be glad to discuss some of those uh, kinds of situations in the back and forth. Thanks. I, w I want to thank my fellow panelists. I want to thank the, uh, the Federalist Society for inviting me here today. And I really want to thank the Federalist Society for continuing to have conventions that welcome dissenting views or ones that people disagree with. I think it's so important. We live in a world where people don't seem to ever want to listen to anybody who disagrees with them anymore. And that's coming from both sides. And I think it's time that we uh, continue to have this kind of tradition of talking against each other. And I come from a family like that. My dad was a conservative Republican. My mom was a liberal Democrat. And even though my mother was so much smarter, uh, <laughs> no matter what, we were able to defend whichever positions that, that, that we wanted to politically. Uh, you know, having said that, there's a little irony of having a former board member of the American Constitution Society here today to defend Justice Scalia. Uh, <laughs> but, but somebody is going to do that. And I guess it's going to be me. Uh, when Sherbert v versus Verner, the case that Smith overruled, was decided it was an iconic liberal case. It was decided by Justice Brennan over the dissent of the leading conservative theorist on the court at that time, Justice Harlan. I was one of only a handful of academics who supported the decision at that time. Yes, I'm that old. I know I don't look it, but yeah. Uh, and uh, I was criticized constantly and mocked even by my liberal friends for my support of the Smith decision. And, and I did so because I found Justice Scalia's reasoning persuasive. As he pointed out, virtually religious belief can apply to anything. So virtually any law could be subject to a free exercise challenge. In order to evaluate the challenge, you have to look at very sensitive issues like, is the claim really religious? Is the believer sincere? Is there a burden on the believer? Those inquiries themselves create Con uh, constitutional kinds of problems. So Justice Scalia was concerned that either using that, the, the uh, compelling interest test, which is used in other areas, would be watered down, or um, the compelling interest test would make virtually every law presumptively unconstitutional, and as Justice Scalia said, make every person a law unto himself. I also added another reason, which was based on a case called Thomas versus Indiana Review Board, in which a religious claimant, this is under the Sherbert regime, was able to get an exemption from a requirement that he needed to work in an armaments factory based upon his religious beliefs. And the court made it clear that if it was just based on a philosophical belief, no exemption. And my question at the time, is that an appropriate distinction? Uh, and it's also in tension with free speech jurisprudence, which says that various views should be treated equally. I think those were particularly good reasons then, and I still do. The question that Fulton raised was, should Smith be overturned? And I just want to briefly go through the criteria of when you overturn a case, stare decisis, that was announced in the Janus case from a couple of years ago, you may remember. There are five criteria that the court listed. The quality of the reasoning, the workability of the earlier decision, inconsistency with related decisions, reliance, and whether there have been some changed facts. 
There's been a lot of discussion about the quality of the reasoning, whether it's originalist or not, so in the interest of time, I'm going to jump over that. I don't think there is a serious claim by Smith defenders such as myself that there was a reliance issue there. There is a reliance issue there, so I'm going to cede that one. But, uh, but with respect to the other three points, the first is on workability. And that was one of the focuses of Justice Scalia's decision in Smith, as I just talked about. Uh, the idea that law should be presumptively con unconstitutional is not a workable standard, and it didn't turn out to be. The court found out that the court did not uphold challenges against, against tax laws. It did not uphold challenges against a Fair Labor Standards Act case, even though exempting a small religious organization from having to pay minimum wage would certainly not depress uh, the wage market around that. Um, the thing is that uh, a compelling interest test, if applied stringently, would allow the religious claimant to win virtually every time. That is why it was never stringently applied under Sherbert. With the respect to the inconsistency with related decisions, the, uh, the decisions that are raised most often are Hosanna uh, Tabor. But as Laurie pointed out, those weren't decided under the Free Exercise Clause. Those were decided under a principle of church autonomy, which predated the Smith decision, which Justice Scalia didn't suggest, whereas in doubt by the, uh, by the Smith decision. And finally, there's the changed understanding of relevant facts. I think this may be in large part the main consideration that is motivating some to overturn Smith. We can see that in Justice Alito's speech here last year, the belief that religion is under attack. I think Justice Alito is referring primarily to mainstream religion, and it is true now, for example, that a majority of white evangelicals believe they are discriminated against, even though 70% of the population is Christian. But even when we accept the fact that some majority religions now feel they are being marginalized, the fact is Minority religions have consistently been under attack in American history, anti-Semitism, anti-Mormonism, anti-Catholicism, and more recently, anti-Muslim. Certainly, Justice Alito is correct that religious discrimination in any form should be condemned. I completely agree. I'm just not sure that there has been a change in the relevant facts. Unfortunately, the fact that religious discrimination exists in the United States is not a changed fact. So if at least we're applying the Janus factors, the arguments for overturning Smith are not particularly compelling. But let me turn to another way of looking at Smith. Justice Scalia's opinion in Smith was not an outlier. Rather, it reflected two broader jurisprudential projects that he advocated. The first is that Smith avoided the need for judicial balancing, a task that Justice Scalia found problematic to say the least. As he wrote in Barnes v. Glenn Theaters, a free speech case, we should avoid, wherever possible, analysis that requires judicial assessment of the importance of government interest. Sherbert's compelling interest test requires exactly that form of assessment. Second, Justice Scalia's jurisprudence, reflect, ju jurisprudence reflected a commitment to neutral laws. Thus, in free speech cases, he supported the rule that generally applicable laws, such as antitrust laws or contract laws, should not be subject to the compelling interest test, even if they had an adverse effect on the press. And in the race context, he was a defender of neutral laws, strictly adhering to Washington versus Davis, holding that disparate impact from a neutral law should not invalidate that law unless discriminatory impact could be shown. And in fact, in Smith, Scalia cites both the speech cases and Washington versus Davis as authority for the Smith decisions. Overturning Smith would place a serious dent in this project. Which leads me to a related point. If we are going to abandon Justice Scalia's commitment to neutral laws, why stop at Smith? If we are going to, uh, neutral laws can have a disparate effect on press freedom, and they certainly can and do have a major disparate impact on race. If we were to adopt a jurisprudence that would overrule Smith and allow religious claimants to prevail against neutral laws without showing discriminatory intent, shouldn't we allow racial claimants to prevail by showing disparate impact without showing discriminatory intent? Some argue that Smith should be overturned because it is often too difficult whether a, target, a law targets religious exercise. But it has proved to be virtually impossible to determine whether a law targets racial discrimination, we could get rid of that problem. Indeed, if the goal is to protect marginalized groups, that rationale should probably apply more to racial minorities than religious majorities. 
There is a pretty good argument to be made, in short, that overruling Smith while retaining Washington versus Davis has the policy interests exactly backwards. One final point. All my liberal friends who criticize my position in Smith have now become much more enamored with the case uh, when, it turns, when it is applied to laws that they like. But the path does not go in one direction. The archdiocese opposed RIFRA because they were concerned that if Roe was overturned, there would be religious exemptions sought to anti-abortion requirements. Uh, we can think of cases that exist or could exist challenging voter ID photo requirements on the basis of religious beliefs, drug laws, or laws restricting which persons, uh, uh, which persons uh, are entitled to welfare benefits, or laws potentially sanctioning people who shelter illegal immigrants. As Justice Scalia indicated, virtually every law, every law, could be subject to a free exercise challenge. There is a message in all this. So let me conclude by, by citing one of the legal, legal philosophers, one of the preeminent legal philosophers of our time, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Thank you. Thank you to my panelists. I think um, what I'll do first is just open the floor. I'm sure somebody said something controversial that pricked somebody to want to say something in response. So does anybody have anything? If not, I'll, I'll do my best to try to make it more controversial and, and, uh, <laughs> and ask something. Akil, go ahead. Um, I think Professor Berg asks a very good question, um, which is, gee, um, if, an, if one thinks that uh, you're only looking at facial, in effect, and not as applied challenges uh, and, the, and the original text and history of the free exercise clause, what about free speech? Um, I think in general there's an insufficient holism um, in constitutional analysis. I think you actually have to think not just about all the clauses of the First Amendment and how they fit together or don't, but how it fits with the second and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth. Um, so um, a fair question. Here's what my con law teacher taught me, that there would be broad protection of political speech and political press even if there were no First Amendment because these things are central to um, how we, uh, 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 a self-governing republic governs itself. Um, it's, a, it's a structural um, principle. Um, even before the First Amendment came along. His name was Robert Bork. You may have heard of him. Um, he's one of the founders of the Federal, uh, intellectual leaders of the Federal Society. Um, one of my other teachers on the left, Charles Black, said the same thing. Um, they both channeled a professor, um, uh, a very eminent professor, uh, Alexander Mickeljohn, who explained that, that um, uh, political speech is how we govern ourselves, how we have fair elections. And so that would be true, uh, and we, we need to protect that even without the First Amendment. Courts didn't for a long time. They w didn't take the free speech and free press clauses seriously. Um, Justice Scalia, at his best, understood this as well in his book, A Matter of Interpretation, whose new foreword um, is written by Akhil Amar and whose new afterward is written by Steve Calabresi, um, Justice Scalia says, asks the question, well, what about, um, is there protection for a handwritten letter? And he says, yes, there is, and I applaud that. Um, but that's actually not the, the literalistic Scalia that many of you know and love. He actually bent his ordinary rules of interpretation because a handwritten letter is not oral speech, nor is it the product of a printing press, and he didn't love unenumerated rights. I actually think to, that there are unenumerated rights, and we identify them in part by looking at the enumerated ones and interpolating and creating a rational continuum and all the rest, but that wasn't just a Scalia style. So why did he actually say that there is a, a constitutional protection for a handwritten letter? Um, and I think partly it's because he was persuaded by his brilliant law clerk that year, whose name is Steve Calabresi. You may have heard of him, too, co-founder and co-chair 
of the Federalist Society. Um, but Steve's intuition, as um, uh, I think, um, as uh, with mine, as with Bork's, as with Charles Black's, as with Alexander Mickeljohn's, is free speech and free press has structural roots independent of actually the text of the First Amendment in a way that isn't exactly isomorphic, exactly the same um, with religion, even though religion is very, very important. It's not quite um, connected to how we govern in the way that political speech and political press and political handwritten letters, for that matter, are. Thank you, Kiel. Any responses, thoughts? Well, why don't we um, go ahead and line up if you want to. At the, I think we've got, I don't see a, a, a microphone there. So I think we've got a microphone in the middle and one over on the far, a far left, right? And I don't think we have one on the far right in this uh, auditorium. So, um, but I'm gonna go, and I'll start by asking a question. I think, uh, first question, this law into uh, themselves, I guess this would be more of a question, uh, Tom and maybe Lori to you guys, but this this concern about, you know, if we have a standard, the, the Sherbert versus standard, we bring it back, it doesn't just create the opportunity to make everything into a law to yourself, and then it, that puts a lot of pressure on other things like religious sincerity, et cetera, and I think it also arguably puts, you know, a lot of pressure on um, judges perhaps having a temptation to water things down in order, because of the potential extreme implications, if you think it has extreme implications. So those kind of concerns, I think, that were raised by Bill. Um, do you have any thoughts about uh, why that isn't as big of a problem as, as some might say it is? Um, well, I mean, we've had the compelling interest standard now in, in RIFRA for um, 27 years uh, and in state RIFRAs for just about as long. And it hasn't led to the kind of disastrous results that uh, that I think that Justice Scalia predicted um, and the, the, the kind that, that you know that you're you're raising I mean it, the it's uh, it, it's going to be more likely that government can show a really strong reason for regulating conduct when it regulates that conduct across the board when it doesn't make exceptions for something else that's the situation that we're we're talking about. And whether that's, you know, whether that means it satisfies a compelling interest or just satisfies some kind of rigorous view, review uh, I don't think that, uh, I, don't, I don't think that matters. Either, either way, I don't think we've seen the kind of, of um, horrendous results that, uh, that were predicted. There are, there are lots of, there's a lot of nuance in this, in this doctrine and in the, in the RIFRA doctrine, right? The, 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 the court looks not at the consequence of overturning this law in question altogether, but it looks at the consequence of granting an exemption in this case, and in other cases fairly determined to be like it. So that, you know, that's a much more focused kind of inquiry, and it allows for the court to make uh, distinctions uh, and, and proceed kind of uh, narrowly um, so I just, you know, I mean, I, th I think the concerns have been uh, overstated. It seems to me that, that, that Smith has been more unworkable than the compelling interest standard has. It's owned by the, you know, the, the court sort of, you know, not following it, really. Uh, and um, so it's back in, the court is back into making determinations about compelling interest, and, you know, the world isn't ending on that either, but more religious practices are protected now than they used to be, as Lori said, and that's a really good thing. Um, the, the, Justice Scalia, the key to Smith is footnote five, and, and he's aware that there actually weren't that many under the Sherbert um, uh, formulation. There weren't that many um, ridiculous exemptions that courts uh, insisted upon. So his parade of horribles was not actually a practical consequential one. Because, um, his parade of horribles was jurisprudential. He actually thought um, this an ad hoc balancing was um, theoretically under a rule of law idea um, uh, just... Um, uh, uh, horrible. Um, he, he, he didn't want the O'Connorization of a court because he was a kind of rule of law as a law of rules kind of fellow. That's the key to footnote five of Smith, 
um, where he you know, talks about um, the parade of horribles and his response to Justice O'Connor. And Michael McConnell has, a, I think, a strong answer to that in his article in response, Free Exercise, Revisionism, after Smith. And, because, um, and what I was trying to say is, if you have to take that seriously, and here are two approaches. The equality approach, comparing um, other exemptions that the law has um, uh, for factories or for, for uh, situations other than religion and trying to analogize it to the religious situation. It's going to be tricky because it won't always be identical identical and you're going to have to decide how, how t- many teeth you're going to put into the um, equality analysis, whether any exemption anywhere mandates exemption for all religions everywhere, the most favored nation status, or something a little bit um, softer than that. But equality actually creates some rules that Justice Scalia could accept. And the other is a John Stuart Mill, no harm to others idea, which I try to link to the idea of a privilege, an idea of the, 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 um, the internal governance among uh, within a church, which is why Scalia understood Hosanna Tabor was different, um, uh, because you're not imposing costs on, on outsiders. I call that the Islands of Lochner approach, because we do actually, in other areas, sometimes try to protect people against themselves, paternal or have all sorts of anti-discrimination rules within an entity, but maybe churches are different. Um, But that would answer, it seems to me, the jurisprudential parade of horribles that was really driving Justice Scalia and Smith. See footnote five. If I can uh, just respond briefly, I think that, you know, I certainly agree uh, with Professor Berg. This is the rare circumstance where you've actually run the experiment. We've been running the experiment for 30 years now. We've had federal RIFRA. We've had state RIFRAs. We've been able to see what happened. And what happened is we actually don't have that many cases as a proportion of the federal docket. It's not that large. It's been manageable. But what's really interesting, and this is where I'm going to agree with, with Professor Marshall, is that RIFRA and the anti-Smith rules are about unpopular religious exercise. Unpopular religious exercise might be a Muslim prison inmate wearing a beard. It might also be the Catholic Church in Philadelphia and its views on marriage. If it's a popular religious exercise, and this is where I agree with uh, Justice Scalia, if it's a popular religious exercise, that's where legislators are likely to be solicitous of religious exercise. And so what we're left with is what are you going to do with the unpopular religious exercises? One other thing that I think is incomplete when we talk about Smith um, is this presumption that we're talking about legislators and they're going to legislate and they're going to get together and pass a law and the executive is going to execute it. What is happening in the real world and what is happening in my clients' cases is that it's not usually that the legislature got together and passed something. It's that an administrative official somewhere said, hey, I got a pen. And then they're able to add something that doesn't have the kind of legislative support and they're able to uh, create additional restrictions on religious exercise. And so I think when we're talking about Smith, uh, it's exactly right. We have to be talking about the structure and the separation of powers. Uh, But it's really troubling to back off on free exercise protection at the same time that these other government powers are growing. Bill? I know there are a lot of people who have to ask yep. questions in a short period of time, so I have some response to some of this, and they're brilliant, but I'll let the go to the question <laughs> instead. <laughs> Sounds good. I think, we'll, I think I believe that the person standing over here was up first, and we'll just go back and forth. So go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. Um, my name is Maggie Beecher. I'm from Natha Legal. My question is for Professor Amar. Um, at the beginning of your remarks, the way that you spoke about the First Amendment, you really strongly distinguished between Congress and what state constitutions said at the time about religious liberty. And I was wondering, um, are you s- sort of advocating that, the fe- that there should be more distinction between um, the limits on the federal government with respect to religious liberty than um, state and local governments? Or um, I don't know if I was picking up some more than you were laying down there. <laughs> oh, that's a brilliant question. Thank you. Um, so the First Amendment is the only amendment that actually talks about Congress making a law as such. And the question is why its language is different than the other amendments. And the answer originally is these were two different amendments initially um, in the first Congress, the first House. They got mushed together by the Senate. And I think for reasons of federalism, because these were domains over which there was perceived to be no proper enumerated 
concentrated power, and we see that. T- we today read it differently. We think it's because they were, they were trying to protect religious expression as well as political expression, but that's because, actually, um, we read everything through the prism of the 14th Amendment, and we look backwards, and religious speakers were very important at the time of abolition, people like Harriet Beecher Stowe, but not at the founding because in state constitutions pre-1789, religion clauses and speech clauses are never actually back-to-back or in the same provision. But now you're saying, okay, so are you, are you saying then that um, uh, there's more protection against states because of the 14th Amendment make or enforce and it doesn't say legislature than against the federal government? No, not necessarily because here's what you need to understand. You need to understand that almost everything that you believe about the Bill of Rights, including calling it the Bill of Rights, comes from the 14th Amendment. It doesn't call itself the Bill of Rights. The framers of the 14th Amendment called it the Bill of Rights. All the Bill of Rights cases that come to your mind are actually 14th Amendment cases, and the 14th Amendment actually has a feedback effect, call it reverse incorporation, upon the First Amendment. We read, and properly so, the First Amendment in light of the 14th, just as if, for example, you're a Christian, I I happen to be, um, you're going to read the Old Testament through the prism of the New Testament. Um, You're going to read the book of Isaiah through the prism of um, the life, death, ministry, teachings, and gospel of, of Jesus Christ. So, so just as, um, um, uh, so we, we call that the Ninth Amendment. They're unenumerated rights against the federal government. And where do you look um, to find them? Partly the 14th Amendment itself. In doctrine, that's called reverse incorporation of the Equal Protection Clause. That's an ugly doctrinal formulation. In um, uh, Bowling versus Sharp, a better way of talking about it is the first sentence of the 14th Amendment says everyone's born a citizen. Everyone's born an equal citizen. What it means to be a citizen is to have rights, and the 14th Amendment actually has a more robust sense of rights, and those rights apply against the federal government under the first sentence of the 14th Amendment um, um, without having to say more. Paul, St. Paul, it says, I have rights because I am a Roman citizen. To be a citizen is to have rights against the federal government, and the 14th Amendment, arguably, if Kurt Lash is right, is expanding the domain of those rights. You needed to say no, no state shall because of Barron versus Baltimore if you want to limit states, but, um, but that broader understanding of rights maybe sensibly applies against the federal government as well by dint of the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment, which doesn't say no state shall, and the 9th Amendment, among other places. Thank you. Next question here in the center. Uh, Owen Smith of Harvard Law. I have a question about the race analogy in Fulton. So in his concurrence, Justice Alito distinguishes between opposition, um, religious motivated opposition to same-sex marriage and opposition to sort of different racial groups or, or intermarriage. And, and the, the reliance he uses for this is uh, the, the, some dicta in Obergefell. And for me, at least personally, that's not a very strong source to base any kind of constitutional claim on. Um, is there a better source for distinguishing between those two things, between saying that uh, religiously motivated opposition to same-sex marriage is honorable, quote-unquote, um, versus opposition to racial groups is not honorable? Or is it just sort of a normative evaluation that he made? Thanks. So, uh, happy to speak on this. Um, I think when we're talking about these questions, you're right, the court has rejected this analogy between uh, religious opposition to racial issues and religious opposition to same-sex marriage. And I think part of the reasoning for that is if you're going to equate these two things in law, are you willing to go all the way? Are you willing to start stripping tax exemptions from religious organizations? Are you willing to crack down on them and make certain beliefs and practices impermissible in polite society as we have done with race? Um, Or are we going to recognize that we are a nation of different and diverse beliefs and that we can allow groups that have different beliefs to be able to to be able to, uh, to coexist and to carry out their beliefs and to be able to live according to that. And so the court has treated that very differently uh, than it has treated race. And I think it's especially important looking at the history, dismantling an entire system of racial segregation and separation in the South and the project that was going on there, uh, as opposed to what we're talking about here, which is allowing an Catholic foster agency that serves primarily children of color and 
serves all children regardless of their race, their sex, their sexual orientation, and saying, no, you guys are just as bad as Piggy Park, as a lot of the amici wanted to argue. Can, can I follow? So I think there's, a, there's a, simply an argument for a historical di uh, distinction between the, the two, just the, sort of the fundamental way in which racial discrimination has been at the core of our our, our worst um, problems in in, uh, in in our constitutional history. So that you could say the government has an interest um, in that that exceeds any any other case. Um, but I'd also say uh, um, the the uh, I, I view the the, uh, the the clash between same sex marriage rights and religious liberty rights as a clash between two um, interests that share a lot of features in common. Um, in both cases, you have people who want to, who, who have an, uh, an identity that is um, fundamental to all aspects of their lives, uh, and that is, uh, they want to express that in, uh, in action, not just in in private belief or just merely having that identity, uh, and the religious believer and the uh, same-sex couple, I think, are on this in the same position uh, on that score, and that suggests uh, that's different from from sort of racial discrimination as sort of simply a discrimination against someone's feature that doesn't involve that kind of complex mixture of conduct and belief and relationships that both religion and same-sex uh, activity, sexual activity, sexual relationships do. Um, so th if those two groups are kind of on the same footing in many ways, that suggests we ought to try to find ways to protect both of them and not s completely subordinate the religious interest to the anti-discrimination interest the way that we've done with, uh, with racial discrimination. Yeah, I agree with that. One of, the, one of the fascinating parts about when we think about religion and discrimination against religion is what exactly are we talking about when we talk about religion? Are we talking about religion as a set of ideas, in which case it's a speech kind of analogy? Or are we talking about religion as a form of individual identity, in which case it's more like a a racial kind of a classification, and I don't think the law is particularly clear on that. And we come up with different ramifications and thoughts of how we're going to treat religion depending on, on how we think about it. When somebody says, for example, I'm a Christian, are they saying I ascribe to a certain set of beliefs or are they saying something else about who they are fundamentally? And I think that leads to some of the contradictions and, and inherent ambiguities in, uh, in how we treat religion. All right, next question over here on the left. Thank you. Michael Rossman, Center for Individual Rights. I have a question for Akhil. Um, let's say a DC agency prohibits the sale of um, kosher meat in the district. Of what? Prohibits the sale of kosher meat in the oh, district. Oh, kosher meat. So no, no, no 14th Amendment, no Congress. Is there a free exercise problem? Oh, sure. Con uh, the, the, the government of D.C. has no powers greater than the um, powers of the uh, Congress. That it's, it's just a delegatee of Congress, and this is a regulation of religion as such because it's not meat but kosher meat. So that's an easy one. All right. Does anybody disagree with Akil? All right. Moving on, then. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Dan Daniel Ortner with the Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, over the past year and a half with COVID-19, I think we saw something unusual, which is that uh, religious claims by churches were successful largely at the Supreme Court and elsewhere, but free speech claims by non-religious organizations like theaters or uh, political associations were not as successful. Um, and I worry that we see religion, uh, religious freedom almost be used as a sword by governments to justify restrictions on speech like theater, theater speech or other speech that's not religious speech. I wonder if anyone, I would like to get whoever has thoughts on this, but the, the, the danger of maybe religious freedom being weaponized against other First Amendment freedoms, if there's a first among equals idea for religion, it can justify not treating other kinds of speech as well. And I wonder what, other, what thoughts the panel has on that. The, uh, the free speech idea originally 
The phrase, the freedom of speech, comes from the freedom of speech and debate in Parliament, uh, English Bill of Rights of 1680 and precursors. Uh, Parliament from the French parler is to speak, and they actually are imagining political discourse as the core. And one sees actually in early state constitutions freedom of speech and debate in legislatures. One sees in Article I, Section 6, freedom of speech and debate in Congress or in the Articles Confederation, certain um, freedom of speech in Congress and it's at its core political discourse. This is connected to the Mickel, John, Bork, Black um, idea of the centrality of, of political expression. In our tradition, of course, we broaden that out. The First Amendment doesn't say just political, but at the founding they were focused particular on that, but especially after the 14th Amendment, um, there are additional foci um, focuses of a special speech concern. Again, textually it applies everywhere, but of course they're thinking about religious speech because the abolitionists were religious as well as political and their religion infused their political views. And they're thinking about literary speech as well. The, the single most important actually um, book that was written um, um, in the generation before the Civil War was um, uh, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. She comes from a preaching family. Lincoln, when he meets her, says, you're the little woman who wrote the big book that made this great war. Um, that's literary and, art and artistic and expressive and religious and political. What else? We could talk about scientific speech as a particular core. Um, I personally think that commercial speech um, should be treated with less solicitude, judicial solicitude, um, than other forms. Not none whatsoever. It, it says speech. I think 44 Liquor Mart is a problematic case. The government's greater power to prohibit gambling or tobacco subsumes here. It's not always true that the greater power subsumes the lesser, but the greater power to prohibit certain transactions subsumes the power to discourage them. We're going to allow gambling but we're going to, or, or tobacco, but we're going to um, discourage them. Because we could prohibit gambling and tobacco altogether. We can't prohibit elections and can't prohibit political discourse or religious assemblies generally. And even today, it's really 9-0 on the Supreme Court that um, the um, Federal Trade Commission um, and, um, and the Consumer uh, Protection Bureaus are allowed to regulate, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, all sorts of um, uh, financial puffery when you basically make false claims about your Tesla cars or how much um, your, your profitability next semester or um, that, that cigarettes won't kill you. Um, we allow government to regulate all sorts of you know, false fraudulent commercial claims, and uh, we don't trust government, and rightly so, to um, regulate uh, false political claims. So, you know, this, this um, tax cut will pay for itself, or this infrastructure bill will pay for itself. Politicians all the time, uh, you know, are engaging in a certain kind of, from their critics' point of view, fraud, um, but the, um, the FEC does not regulate um, that kind of political fraud, the way the SEC regulates um, puffery when it comes to uh, 10 Qs and 10 Ks and, and, and financial statements. So, so we, we actually do, even today, have differential standards for, let's say, commercial speech on the one hand, than political, religious, artistic, and scientific speech. So uh, I think that, you know, it, in... In, in many um, domains, um, r religious and political speech kind of stand on the same footing for the reasons that, um, that Akhil has said. But I don't, think, I don't think worship services should just be treated as simply uh, matters of speech, right? There are many other things that go on there besides e expression. I mean, unless you go into like to a Protestant uh, service where, you know, all it is is about the sermon. Uh, 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 but that's not true for many kinds of worship, right? It's communal activity, it's receiving the, the sacraments and so on. Those, are, are, th those go beyond expression. And, e e you know, even the sermon aspect, this is, this is the core, uh, you know, at the core of a, of a separate right to exercise religion. And so what, what you've got here is the, the fundamental problem in the First Amendment of putting together a speech clause that, has a strong neutrality component across different beliefs, including religious beliefs, with these distinctive rules about religion that protect religious exercise and that also prohibit the establishment of religion. They don't prohibit the establishment of all sorts of, of other ideas. And uh, uh, religious folks don't like that when the establishment clause is used as a, as a means to you know, 
restrict uh, religion in the public schools and so on, but it's consistent to say that there are special limits on what the government can say religiously and also special limits on restricting worship. So I don't see any problem with saying a church or a, or a synagogue can make a, wor a claim about worship under a RIFR or under the Free Exercise Clause that a theater can't, can't make. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I do think underlying the speech clause is this idea of, of equality of ideas. And one of the reasons, again, that I supported Smith was why should we distinguish somebody who doesn't want to work in an armaments factory for religious reasons as opposed to, as opposed to um, secular reasons or deep moral objection to it? And I think we have to be careful, and the court has been careful, of not creating a speech system in which religious speech or religious kinds of speech are preferred over other kinds of speech. You know, on the first question when I didn't respond earlier to allow other questions and things, and Tom, Tom made the argument that the compelling interest test uh, against religion would probably be less powerful than it is against speech. And I don't think that's right. And the reason why that's not right is because let me give an example from Tom's state of the Minnesota State Fair in a case called Iscon versus Heffron. And in that case, the State Fair had a rule, by the way, that was precipitated by two of the most vile cults in American history, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, <laughs> that people had to confine the distribution of literature to a booth. The Hare Krishnas challenged that under both the free exercise clause and the speech clause because they claimed that they had a religious compulsion to go out there into the community and approach people. In front of the Minnesota Supreme Court, it only dealt with the free exercise case, and it looked at it and said, look, there are only 13 Hare Krishnas here. The state interest in preventing congestion and preventing some other things isn't very powerful when you're only dealing with 13 Krishnas, because they looked at the at the test to say you don't weigh the state's interest against everybody, you weigh it only against the people who are advocating their religious belief. In front of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said no, we can't favor religious speech over, over uh, secular speech. And so that if any, if the Krishnas are going to have the right to go into the marketplace, then everybody is. And when everybody has the right to go into the state fair and go everywhere, the, the problems with congestion become so much greater. So by expanding the amount of people who are, who are entitled to claim the freedom, you've expanded the power of the state's interest. When you have just a narrow group of people claiming the right, the state's interest is less compelling. One of the cases in pre sherbert was one I referenced before, Tony and Susan Alamo challenging the legality of minimum wage requirements because they claimed they had a religious objection to it. There's not a really strong argument that you have a compelling interest against a small religious store because that's not going to depress wages. But if you talk about the state's interest or the government interest as a whole to try to prevent a depressed wage market, it does become compelling. So the fact is the compelling interest test applied only to religious observers is going to be much more powerful than when applied to a broader category of, of uh, individuals. Well, but Bill, you pick, you pick cases in which there are kind of self-interested reasons to pursue the conduct, right? I mean, but, you know, the fact that a Jehovah's Witness can refuse, refuse a blood transfusion doesn't mean that people are suddenly going to start lining up to refuse blood transfusions, <laughs> no, right? But, but, and, and, and people, because Amish can, uh, uh, you know, ride a buggy in Minnesota without displaying a, an orange triangle doesn't mean that a lot of people are going to want want to do that. So uh, I agree that when the exemption is of the kind that is, is likely to trigger a lot of other claims, and the court has said this too, this is one of the categories that can, that make the compelling interest test manageable or the categorical kinds of distinctions. If you've got a self-interested exemption, then you can expect lots of claims, maybe insincere claims, and that can create the, the compelling interest. But that's not a reason to get rid of the test in a, the very large number of cases in which there's not a particular self-interest in asserting the, uh, the well, exemption. But I think that plays right into Justice Scalia's theory that you're going to water down the compelling interest test. Uh, if you start taking into consideration that other people may claim this thing, and that's your compelling interest for preventing 
for, uh, for preventing something from happening, the, the exercise, that, that's, that's watering down the test. The compelling interest test is much more powerful and administrative efficiency is not usually a reason to set, not usually a justification to satisfy that application. So you need a theory, Tom, that, that, that deals with both the kinds of cases, blood transfusions, where people are not lining up to get the exemption, and one that does, in which exemptions to taxes or exemptions to Fair Labor Standards Act or exemptions from, from insurance requirements you don't like uh, does attract people to, uh, to uh, adopt or claim a religious objection. If, if I could just respond to that, I do think that there are several features that are present in the law now and especially are present in RIFRA that do help to account for that. One is the compelling interest. If it's something where there's a real uh, incentive like taxes, uh, the court has treated the government's interest as particularly strong in those cases because it's easy to see why somebody would want to bend the rules. Uh, the other thing is, of course, sincerity, as we've talked about. Again, this is somewhere where if there's a real incentive to bend the rules, the courts may want to look more closely. This comes up a lot in the prison context because uh, prisoners make a lot of claims, and so prison systems have actually developed um, processes to look at sincerity. The other place it comes up is in the draft context, where they look very uh, carefully at sincerity, because there's an incentive there. Um, the third thing I would mention that hasn't come up today is burden, and this is something that is in RIFRA. It's in some of the state statutes. It was derived from Sherbert. I'm sure we could have a long discussion about how it operates in the constitutional context, but this idea that there's does, you do need to show something, something more than just that cognizable interest that gives you into Article III court, but there does need to be some kind of burden. I do think that that, uh, that requirement does some work in cases like a leafleting case. You know, is it really a burden on your religion to stand here versus stand there? It's easy to see if we've said you can't go and meet in your synagogue at all because of COVID. Um, it's more difficult and, you know, perhaps starts to look more like some of these speech cases and time, place, and manner restrictions when your religious exercise is not being prohibited outright, but maybe just channeled a little. Well, in Sherbert itself, though, Sherbert itself was one of these kinds of cases. Somebody didn't claim a religious objection not to work on Saturdays. A lot of people don't want to work on Saturdays for a lot of reasons. Uh, that created an incentive for people to claim a religious belief, and yet... Uh, and yet the court didn't find that there was a compelling interest there. If we're going to return to the pre-Sherbert regime, to the pre-Smith regime and bring back Sherbert, I would assume that would mean bringing back the results in Sherbert. All right, well, I think I'm going to step in here. The, the only hard part of the job that they give us moderators is that we have to end on time. And so, <laughs> unfortunately, I mean, this is, uh, first of all, I want to thank the audience for uh, just very stimulating questions, obviously, as we just saw here. And I want to thank the panelists for a very stimulating discussion. So thank you very much. Why don't you join me in giving the final hand?